This episode of the Old Dogs REI Network is brought to you by Mino Studio. In a world where jobs are how most people make money, one man, one desire, one challenge dares to break the mold. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where we don't work for money. Money works for us. Coming soon. Viewer discretion advised. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manacero. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. I'm your host, Bill Manacero, and this is the show where 50 plusers and anyone else who wants to join us get solid, no sales pitch real estate investing advice to help generate real cash flow. This podcast airs twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays, and if you aren't already a subscriber, go to iTunes, type in Old Dog, spelled D A W G, find our podcast, and subscribe. Well, we have a fun show for you today. I'm I'm very stoked about this because uh, uh, this uh, young man is uh, actually just kicking it in Airbnb. It just basically owns the YouTube uh, in terms of Airbnb is concerns. I'm talking about Sean Rocky Jeech. Sean is a serial entrepreneur and accidental Airbnb host. After discovering the earning power of short-term rentals, Sean, within three years, built a $2 million per year cash-flowing real estate business with no debt or financing. That's right. You guys heard it right. Sean is now the host of the popular YouTube channel, Airbnb Automated, where he's taught thousands of people for free to realize their potential and build Airbnb-based businesses. Wow. Well, Sean, welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. Well, thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. And thank you for getting the last name right. I really appreciate your care and making sure that you hit that. Oh, no. It's a, it's a, I, I like it. It's a cool name. Very cool name. I just didn't, <laughs> I didn't want to butcher it. So <laughs> thank you. I feel... Whoosh. It's a strange one. It's if you're not Serbian or any anywhere in that part of the world, I doubt that you'd you'd catch it. There's only been one person in my life who's looked at that last name and actually was able to pronounce it, and I was stunned. Um, <laughs> I sadly made a bet with that person uh, for fifty dollars that they couldn't pronounce it, so <laughs> I picked the wrong person to make a bet with. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, well, I'll, I'll just be calling you by your first name if that's okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's totally fine. Sean's good, too. All right, great. Well, Sean, you've got a great story. First discovered you. I was uh, I am a, an Airbnb operator. I've got an apartment building where I, I decided to experiment and take a couple of uh, units and convert them to um, longer-term Airbnb, a sort of minimum 30-day Airbnbs, just to see how it went. And it mm -hmm. just kicked. I mean, just kicked off. It was amazing. And I was totally doing everything wrong and totally didn't, you know, so of course I went to YouTube, which is the great reference library for the world today. And I, you know, I discovered your channel and man, you really do give out great information for folks. And I, I'm, I'm amazed that uh, it is all for free. And uh, um, there's just, just great stuff there. So when I saw that, I said, 
gee, I got to have this guy on because you, you've got your own niche too. There's a lot of different people doing sort of, you know, vacation rentals to, uh, you know, just sort of traditional Airbnb and, well, but you've, you've got a, a very unique, uh, niche. I, I know it's in the arbitrage space and, and we'll talk about that too, but, but first, before we get started, you know, our audience likes to know who our guests are. And so I, I would love for you to share your story, um, you know, where you came from, how you kind of grew up and, and, uh, and eventually ended up in this, uh, crazy world of Airbnb. Yeah. Okay. So came, came from and grew up. We're going to, we're going to throw the stone way back there. So I was born in, into a military family. So we moved around a lot. So growing up where kind of didn't happen until maybe I was six years old and we settled into Wisconsin. So I spent most of my young years in a small farm town of Darien, Wisconsin. Um, that's actually in between Darien and Delavan. Um, if anybody on, on this podcast knows where that is. Um, and so I spent, yeah, I spent the, the majority of my young life living there until probably about the age of uh, 18. And then I, I, I ended up going to college for music after taking a year off and working in a factory. Decided that, you know, it goes from okay, maybe maybe school's a good idea. Factories aren't so cool. Um, but got into sales, moved to Houston, Texas, tried to learn to become a sales manager, kind of like fought my way through that. Kind of had this this rough and tumble up and down through there. My parents weren't the most awesome role models. And so we, we grew up super poor and without really much discipline financially or otherwise. I kind of had to learn the the lumps of being responsible on my own. Um, didn't, didn't figure that whole thing out probably till about 2010 because I probably more so for pride than anything ended up going homeless in 2009 while in Houston. So Whoa. that was fun. Yeah. So I left a company that I, I got moved to Houston for, I was promoted into a sales management position. Uh, they demoted me eventually. Um, and I took that really like hard. So I took my savings, disappeared, decided I was going to become a business owner hung out at a Starbucks on the corner of Post Oak and Westheimer for two months and just read a ton of books. And, you know, the, the total classics like, you know, Think and Grow Rich, Four Hour Work Week, um, like all the, all the stuff that people typically tend to break into. And um, I ended up running out of money while trying to have a marketing company, went homeless, lived out of my van for a while, um, and then started my first like successful business in 2010, um, which was also in sales because that was my thing. Um, and that can, that business is still actually in play to this day, but that business is what allowed me to kind of accidentally stumble o over Airbnb in 2014. 2014, I think, is what kind of brings us to the point of relevancy for, for a while we're here because this podcast is obviously real estate driven. Um, you got it. Mm -hmm. What was the sales business that you initially launched that uh, really you know got you sort of funded to be able to do more? So I build sales teams that hang out at grocery stores and they sell newspaper subscriptions to people who are passing by inside of grocery stores. Um, our company more so specializes now in reaching millennials and trying to convince millennials to pay for their news, uh, which is a tall order. Um, a lot of people under the age of 40 think that it, like information should be free. I've, uh, you, found, you found my channel on YouTube. It's free to watch if you can deal with the ads that pop up. Um, and anybody who knows like YouTube and Google exist tend to think that they can just search for something and get facts for no cost. So newspapers are just getting crushed, um, by the internet. And so my business, um, specializes in finding ways to, to kind of reach audiences and convince them that paying for quality journalism is still a thing that should happen. Wow. Well, that's uh, definitely, I, I'm sure there's folks in our audience that would uh, relate to that. I, I know a lot of people that, uh, you know, are still, you know, they're waiting for their newspaper to arrive and they go down, they get their cup of coffee and they, you know, boom, they, they, they're mm -hmm. old school, you know, but you're right. Yeah. You know, most of the, most of the younger folks today, it's just, you know, if they can't get it, you know, free online or, or a Google search, then, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to buy it. You know, it's just, it's, it's weird. Wow. So you're doing this. Okay. Um, uh, but you know, how, that, that doesn't sound like it has anything to do with real estate or, uh, Airbnb. So there, something happened, right? Really, truly. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to spoil the, the party a little bit later. Just let me, I'll let you know that, but don't worry. It's not going to be so bad. Um, <laughs> so a <laughs> little teaser for the, for later in this yeah, podcast. Yeah, really, I like it. So yeah. hold on, you guys. Yep. Hold on for that. <laughs> so how Airbnb happened for me is, um, I had a sales manager, his name's Sal. He is now the sales director or the director of sales nationally for Rolex. The guy is definitely 
kind of done his thing. He used to sell timepieces before he worked with me. I brought him into Houston from Detroit. And as part of his move, I gave him a relocation package because at the time I was reading about recruiting and how you can get high performers and what you need to do. So I thought it was smart to sign a year-long lease at a high-rise in Houston for him to live there for two months of that year-long lease. Not, not the best move because <laughs> I have 10, 10 months of a lease I've got to pay for once he moved out. Oh, um, and to add, uh, to add to that problem, he moved out into the same building with a person he was in a relationship with. She got homesick and wanted to move back to Detroit. So almost immediately after he signed another lease, he decided to move back to Detroit. And I did the sweetheart thing of taking his lease over without a plan. So I had two apartments that I'm paying rent on. And I lived in that building too. So that's, I guess, where the bright side of this was, is I now had three apartments in the same building, two of which I had no use for. Um, But I was making enough money that I could just eat the loss, but I wasn't happy with the idea. So after a couple months of just like trying to find a way to like fill it up on Craigslist, find a tenant, um, I was hanging out with a friend of a friend and she mentioned that she stayed um, at an Airbnb property. And that was the first time I heard the word while I was, while I was in the in middle of needlessly paying $4,000 a month in rent. Oh, um, and, and so that's kind of how I, I just fell into it. Um, I had furniture in both of them. So all I had to do was really take photos and list it. Um, my first one, the one that I did the relocation package for, the total cost to get into that apartment was like $4,000 or less because that building was giving away eight weeks of rent for free. So the only cost to start up my real estate endeavor per se was the like $3,500 I spent on furniture. To, so I of course didn't use it immediately for Airbnb, but that was my launch cost. And if I had put it on Airbnb starting day one, like it would have, we were profiting, we were net profiting double our rent. So our rent at the building was 6,000 a month for all three apartments. And I was net profiting $6,000 on top of it all. Gee, so I wish I would have put it all on Airbnb right away. I ended up, I ended up moving out of that unit kind of, um, whenever all three were full, I'd go sleep at a hotel. I would use Priceline and find some <laughs> cheap hotel in the Galleria and stay there for 50 bucks while I was renting out my room for 150 bucks, you know? So that, that became my thing. I was like, su- I was pseudo homeless again, but in a good way. Wow. So it, it did, uh, now you furnished these or they, or were they already furnished apartments? So I, I furnished them on my own. Um, okay. So I didn't. I did the whole Craigslist thrifting thing for a bit. Um, one of the places I, I got like a, a love sectional couch. It was kind of. It was. I spent too much, but it was on my apartment. So one of the apartments looked super super good because it was my own space. The other ones were more economically uh, furnished because I was doing like the thrifting thing. Gotcha. Wow, uh, that's that, that. What an amazing. <laughs> you know, you just like you said, you're, you're accidental Airbnb host here. Yeah. And you just you didn't know what you're doing. Basically, you just you just signed up for Airbnb and stuck these properties on and kind of played it from there. Mm hmm. Yeah. And the whole four years to follow was exactly that theme. Here I am. What do I do? Right. So <laughs> we the, the building calls me months later, says you can't Airbnb. Right. They're like, you can't do this. Oh, so you didn't talk to management or anything. You just no, said, oh, okay. because when I picked up those three leases, my intention wasn't to Airbnb. So I accidentally did something that I didn't tell them I was going to be doing. Ah, okay. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. So the, the spin on that was I then had to suddenly read through my lease and start learning about lease law and how to defend myself as a tenant who just, I was now doing something that the building didn't like. Um, and here's the kicker, right? It actually worked out. Um, I discovered um, that by being an LLC, which is how I signed my leases as a company, I said, Hey, I'm a corporation. I'm going to be putting an employee in this building. And then this guy, Sal, he signed for a lease under my LLC again. Um, I, I based, all three leases were under my LLC low key. The reason why I was doing LLC leases was I got evicted in 2009 when I went homeless and I still couldn't get approved for an apartment. So if I wanted to live anywhere, I had to use my LLC. So oh. that's why I was using my LLC to lease places. So just by happenstance, my leases were under my LLC, which in certain lights can bypass subletting law. And at this time, there were no like pieces of language in standard leases saying that you could not advertise your dwelling for like uh, on like a lodging site like Airbnb. This was pre like pre like boom. So 
my leases only had a no subletting clause. It didn't have anything else that would prevent the business. So all I had to do was argue with the, with the building that technically I wasn't subletting because my company wasn't a tenant. My company could declare an occupant a human to stay here, but that human who was staying there wasn't having another human. So wh- whatever person I put in there was under the company, which wasn't subletting. And that was that's actually how I survived my first year at that building. Um, they they non renewed my leases. They decided, you know, we're not going to keep your leases. So after the year was over, I was out. But it gave me a long enough time to understand that this thing was like legit. So um, at the end of that year, I just simply found another building to move my my furniture to, and um, kept it going. Um, and we kept it small until the Super Bowl in 2017. But yeah, we were able to f- like kind of have a good side income by happenstance. Now approaching the new building, you obviously um, realized that there was a an issue with landlords there. How, how were you able to convince the the new building landlords to uh, accept what you were going to do? So that's a that's a fun and long conversation. I will <laughs> give you some of I'll give you some of it. Um, typically, um, typically I do like. I I do like calls one on one where I give people like a script and we go over it for 40 minutes. But here's the skinny. Any any time that I teach somebody how to pitch a building, there's some things that are always in common here. Um, You represent yourself as a corporate housing company, and that's the best way to talk to a building. Um, And I call it I call it selling by analogy. Uh, a lot of apartment complexes, they'll work with a corporate housing company. Typically, that person, that company, will come and say, "Hey, we'd like five apartments. We've got ten employees from Shell. We're trying to place." Um, they're going to stay here for four months. So a corporate housing company signs a lease. Somebody else is living there for four months. They rent furniture. They get out. So buildings are used to that. That's a, that's a lease that's signed by the LLC. So they're, that's like in the same ballpark. Short-term rentals could very much well be identical if you happen to get that Shell employee for four months. It's the same exact relationship. Short-term rentals, though, have the option of under 30 days. So what I do is I start the conversation as a corporate housing company, and then when I'm in person at that building and they're doing the walkthrough and they're trying to sell me the building, like, yes, you should totally like stay here or have your people stay here, we then start talking about the nuances of my business model, like one fact, one digestible fact at a time. So that way it doesn't really spook them. It allows them to ask questions and kind of ease into the fact that this is the new thing. Corporate housing companies are also doing this. Everybody who does furnished rentals would like the option of short term. So by being the business first and then introducing a topic such as Airbnb, you're able to build trust with them first without them hearing Airbnb and go, oh, I've heard all the stories about Airbnb. We don't want to do that. That's like the the hardest part is overcoming that Airbnb brand hurdle because there's there's a lot of horror stories out there about bad things that happen. So you kind of have to get a connection with the building first get them to trust you as a business that you utilize Airbnb as one of the ways that you could fill your property up, but not the only way. Um, I had a, like, for example, I had an apartment complex where I placed a temporary nurse that became a long-term and she paid for 14 months of rent in a unfurnished because she brought her own furniture in. She just paid rent plus $1,300 a month to have her own furniture and have the option of leaving whenever she needed to, but she didn't leave for 14 months. So, Gee, yeah, <laughs> yeah. All that's I had to do was nice get the lease club. in my name. It was insane. Wow. So, that's that's really that's really the skinny is approach them as a corporate housing company, somebody that does furnished accommodations. Focus on your executive presence, so you seem like an integrity-based, trustworthy type of business, and then introduce the things that they don't understand yet with the uh, with the willingness to have a like a good, steady conversation with them about it. Um, try to make it not a sale. You're not really asking for permission to do it. If you kind of go to a building with your hand out, like, hey, I'd like the Airbnb, your apartment, you're going to get no's because Airbnb's brand is just so strong that it it really kind of eclipses you as the business owner. And that's, that doesn't give you any control in the negotiation. Do they generally ask you like, well, tell me some of the companies you represent as a corporate housing company. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. So I'll tell them about different companies that we have housed because you should be doing more than Airbnb. Right. So what's cool about this, um, and we, I guess we're kind of circling into the, the spoiler here where I said I'm going to spoil the party. Um, let me <laughs> let me give you let me give you that philosophy. Um, I don't see Airbnb as a real estate play. I'm one of the few people who does not. And it's surprising when people hear me say this because it uses real estate. I've got almost 100 doors now. Right. That we have on Airbnb. And I still don't see it as a real estate based business. It's a business. Right. So you're using real estate. You're leveraging technology. You're taking any real estate. You can own it. You can rent it. You can you can take somebody else's property. You're not even renting and just split their profit. Those are probably the three ways that you can use Airbnb is by buying a home, 
Um, and if you're like in San Diego, right, or if you're Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and I bet there's a lot of people in your network who probably would love to buy a home in Fort Lauderdale, um, those homes make twenty five or thirty thousand dollars a month in the summer, like in the winter. Serious. And so if you own that home, dead serious. I did some market research for somebody who's like, hey, could, do you think South Florida is a good option? I'm like, well, let me find out. And I was just floored because I was reverse engineering what people were making by looking through Airbnb. And you can actually do that by you can secret shop people and find out what they're making. So you can own a property and four months out of the year, just just make like one hundred thousand dollars in cash flow. And then you could keep it on Airbnb and make more of a normal amount of money in the in the off season. Or you can rent like I do, which I try to talk to a building and take a lot of property off their hands so I could get a real sweetheart deal when I'm renting, like get months for free, discounts off rent, things like that. Um, or you can do a rev share model. And so in places like Vancouver, uh, Seattle, um, probably even San Diego now because you have to be the owner of the property typically to, to host on Airbnb. A person who's a professional operator like me could go to other hosts or other owners and say, hey, I know you want to be on Airbnb and you know it's not sustainable with just one property, but I have a team of, of like customer service reps, housekeepers, et cetera, and I can represent your property and 20 others and give you the same advantages of scale without actually having to try to break the law to get there. So in cities where a lot of homeowners are kind of like they're kind of cut off you know, or capped. Um, co-hosts or revenue share models are another way to use Airbnb. So you're not even the tenant. You're just a, a professional operator that's representing them. So there's multiple ways to make money on Airbnb. Uh, and to bring that all back, I don't see that as a real estate play. I think Airbnb is a technology. And if anything, as, a po like, as, as part of this uh, podcast of yours, people should look at Airbnb as a tool in their real estate portfolio. Right. So um, if somebody wants to buy property uh, and they're trying to figure out what's the best way to make money on that property. There's pros and cons to long term tenants. There's pros and cons to Airbnb. Um, they should look at it as a tool and being very much familiar with its applications could pretty much maximize anybody's profitability, no matter how they're entering the real estate market. If they're buying multi units, if they're buying single family homes, um, just understanding the platform allows you to have more, uh, I guess, more playability with your with your equity. That's great. That's a, that's a really, uh, I, I, I think that uh, focus makes a lot of sense because you're right. It is, it is, it's a platform, you know, I, what you do with it now, this, and this is something too, I want to, first, I want to ask you a quick question here is, do you own any of the, the Airbnbs that you rent out no. I mean, that, that you oversee? No. Okay. None. So you don't own any of them. Wow. Zero. Okay. Zero dollars of equity aside from the furniture. I own, I own all furniture. I think I've got like 400 or 500,000 dollars in furniture. Okay. Gotcha. Wow. One of the things that really appealed to me, you know, as I, as I saw what you did and, and, you know, saw some of your videos and so forth was, um, just a real appeal to the folks that we're targeting that are 50 years of age and older is that you, um, yeah, these are people, okay. They've worked a full-time job somewhere for years. They're retired or are going to be retired. They don't want another job necessarily, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and the thing that appeals to me about what you're doing is the it, you know, it's Airbnb automated. Okay. Yep. That word. Okay. Is the fact that, that talk about Tim Ferriss and for our work week. I mean, you're, you're geared toward taking as much of this process as possible and, in, in offloading it. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. So uh, you have employees in any business, right, that, that tends to be automated or you outsource, right? You have contractors or you have employees. And so the way that I've been looking at this is in order to automate an Airbnb-based portfolio, you need to give key positions enough work every week for them to be able to make a full-time livable income, right? They need to be proud of their work and make enough money. So when I first had my three apartments in 2014, it wasn't big enough to automate. And I realized that when the Super Bowl hit that there's some serious money to be made in 2017. And I was still the operator. So I, I, I had like four apartments or five apartments and I wanted to get up to 10 within the couple months so I could be there on time for the Super Bowl. And when that hit, we made like $15,000 in profit on that weekend. It was awesome, right? Oh, and that was, but that, that's small potatoes when you look at the scale of Airbnb. So we got up to 10 apartments, made 15,000 bucks in a weekend. I'm like, this is huge, right? This could be so much bigger. It's insane. Um, and so I decided that if I wanted to scale this business, I needed to start hiring like more employees. And I had a housekeeper at that point. Um, I went from hiring like an outside housekeeping company that was charging $45, actually $55, uh, uh, an apartment 
which was the lowest I could find because other people wanted like $40 an hour or $50 an hour. And so I haggled my way down to 55 bucks a, a door. Um, I decided to in-house a housekeeper at $12 an hour. And so now our company, we hire our housekeepers at $12 an hour and we of course give them raises over time, just like anybody would get. And at about 15 doors, I hired a property manager who manages the housekeeping staff, the scheduling for them, the logistics, and also dealt with customer relationships. So at about 15 doors, I was able to pretty much automate the local operations, but the heart of the customer service and sales was still really like done a lot by me. And there's, there's another part of it with hotels, Airbnb alike, pricing strategy is another side of it. And that's kind of like the geeky technical stuff that I really, really love. So even though I, I could automate that today, I still like doing that. So every morning I'll have my coffee and I'll look at like how many guests we have and what our prices are for the day. And I'll play with those numbers. So I could automate that too. But as you grow, you can create specialized positions like a housekeeping manager or a sales manager or an operations manager. You'll realize over time that certain people are good for certain parts of your business and you can plop those, those pieces in and eventually the machine runs all on its own. You create like a fishbowl, a little ecosystem. So in Dallas, we have 40, we have 40 apartments. And so what, what automation looks like in Dallas, we have about five separate buildings totaling the 40 apartments that we have. I have one territory manager, her name's Haley and she's awesome. She runs everything in Dallas. She has a couple of assistants that do customer service. And then she's got about a team of 10 housekeepers. Um, I've given her the power of the pen to buy whatever she needs for the territory. So she's constantly buying toilet paper and shampoo. You know what I mean? She's buying tons of stuff. Um, and then the housekeepers go in and clean. If there's any issues with guests or stolen stuff, the housekeepers figure that out and Haley takes over. Um, and everything just kind of runs. And she cuts the payroll checks for the, the housekeepers and everything. That's what automation looks like. And I really think you can achieve automation at about 15 doors. You just become really profitable with it if you can get that same city up closer to 25 doors. Um, after about 25 apartments or houses that you have on Airbnb, it's a lot of work and your your manager will need an assistant at about that point. And if you understand just that, that, just that aspect that you're automating by employing leadership into your organization and creating a business, you're actually creating a business around your apartments, that's how you achieve automation. And how much time are you spending with your your manager that's overseeing that? Now, that's one region you're talking about, right? That's Dallas, yeah. Okay, so you're in multiple, aren't you international? Not yet. We're in okay. Philadelphia, Houston, and Dallas, Fort Worth area. So we're in three cities in the States. Okay, so does that mean you have three different managers for each region? Exactly right. Okay, gotcha. You're asking how much time I spend um, with that management, right, on Dallas. And the, the number is so close to, to zero hours, so, so stinking close to zero hours that she complains that I don't call her anymore. So um, <laughs> that's one thing that I as a leader need to work on is when things are running right, I disappear. I only show up to fix problems. And that's not good for the morale of a leader. Um, somebody in the organization that's still technically upper middle management, they still need to hear from their, their supervisor, their direct you know, um, up, upline to let them know that they're, they're doing an awesome job and to celebrate with them. So that's one thing I'm trying to work on more is to celebrate the wins with my leadership, even though they don't need me, they still want me around and I need to do a better job of not being so distant. Um, if I wanted to truly automate, then I need to hire like a CEO for the company, somebody who could do that for me and be that ring leader and celebrate with the, with the territory managers and make them feel like they're, they're getting more than just the paycheck from the job. Now, do you visit the different regions or periodically? Yeah, um, I do, um, and it's mostly just for business development. If I don't, if I don't need to go to a city, I typically tend to not. Um, I'm in Houston right now because we're picking up 18 new apartments, and then I'm flying to Philadelphia because we're picking up 21 new apartments this week. And I'll swing by Houston because we're picking up four, but she doesn't need me for that. She's got it all under control. But I'll just swing by and say hi. Okay. You, 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 I love that you talk a little fast because it, it's a lot of information in a short period of time. But yeah. I, I just got a glance over it. You're picking up 21 apartments in, in Philadelphia, did you say? That's correct. Uh, we're picking up 21. Now, how do you pick up? Is that like one building or is that like multiple buildings? Or I mean, where, how do you pick up 21 in one? I mean, one. Yeah. So it is one building. Um, okay. I said to my realtor, as we're doing different deals, he, he fetched me a deal where we're still in negotiation for up to 20 apartments in one building. 
as we're going through this negotiation, it's taking way too long. They just seem to kind of want everything, and we're not getting the deal done in time. And I had a timeline. I'm like, I need these doors because I'm trying to go to Columbia mid-November, and I need to get my deals done so I can go on vacation. Um, and if I don't, then I'm going to be super un unhappy. So as we're like, kind of like grabbing coffee, talking about projects, I walk by a building and I say to him, I'm like, I want this building. Now you say you're realtor. Are you talking about a regular yes. realtor? An apartment locating realtor. So somebody who specializes in leases, but otherwise, yes, any realtor in any major city can also do leases. And I have a couple realtors that I trust. I won't tell everybody my business model. And here's one tip for your, for your channel, uh, for your, for your podcast. Anybody who's going to work with a realtor, you play your cards close to your vest. Do not tell them about your business model all the way because they will create competition for you. If you tell somebody, hi, I've got this wonderful opportunity. I want to pick up 30 apartments. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to furnish them, put them on Airbnb, and I'm going to make triple the rent. You tell that to a realtor, he will start peddling his, this product to every investor that they know, going, hey, guys, you need to get in on this. Right? This is some real stuff. Until you trust a realtor, all you tell them is, I have a corporate housing company. I need to find apartment complexes that are corporate housing friendly. Can you give me a list? And here's the specs. I want to pay this much in rent. I want them to have a pool and a gym. I like these neighborhoods in my city. You just give them your wish list on, on amenities and stuff, and you just tell them corporate housing. Then you do the negotiation from there with the building. Um, you will create competition if you give a stranger that's a realtor too much information. Even my best friend accidentally didn't realize that he was stepping on my toes by peddling this product to other people. So I kind of had to like, like throttle back and say, hey, man, don't tell the world what I'm doing, okay? Because you're, you're actually going to like put too many sharks in the water. Um, so that's my advice for you on the real estate side. But yeah, long story short, um, I am using realtors, regular old realtors that have a broker that they report to every morning. And um, essentially what they're doing is they're finding buildings that are lease friendly for me. In this case, this realtor in Philadelphia has done a wonderful job because he's been able to get his hands on the owners of these new buildings. Um, Philadelphia has a lot of construction right now. Um, Dallas does too, though. Like 14% of Dallas's apartments are under construction. So in a year, Dallas is going to have 14% more apartments. And building owners are just like they've got cotton mouth over it. They're not happy. And so it's a big negotiating point right now that a company like mine – or another real estate partner who does rental arbitrage can take a lot of their apartments off their hand and guarantee rent. And if the market has too many apartments, you know, and not enough people to live there, at least they got, they've got their building full because they got smart and they worked with us. So I have a couple of realtors that are kind of like singing that song. And in Philadelphia, this realtor is getting hold of the building owners. So I had a sit down with the developer of this one building where we're taking 21 apartments kind of, you know, gave him my pitch. We had a long conversation over coffee, talked about the pros, cons, the benefits, the risks, and we made an agreement on, we made an agreement on rent that was different than his advertised rate. We made an agreement that I was going to get the first four to six weeks for free, um, three year long leases. And uh, we told him how quickly we'd like to take each door. And so, yeah, we're picking up 21 apartments in one building with two other buildings, the same type of negotiation. So we may end up picking up 60 in Philadelphia over the next like two months, if Gee all the negotiations go through. Whiz. And and how does the realtor get paid on that? He gets a commission from the landlord per door. <laughs> so you're not paying anything? The first year my realtor in, in Dallas worked with me, no. My realtor has made a quarter million dollars off of me on leases. <laughs> Gee whiz. Isn't that insane? <laughs> He's so happy to work with me. So is this a regular thing? I mean, I never heard of an apartment locating realtor. This is the first time I've heard that. I'll tell you this, and I'll use names because he's not he's not necessarily excited to hire people. He tried. but So my best friend's name is Sean Ray in Dallas. He's a real estate agent. He has switched into home sales, uh, but he does comps on real estate-friendly homes in Dallas. So he, for a while, tried to manage apartment locators and try to build a brokerage. He tried to do that typical thing. Um, there's so much commission being a sales rep in leasing that like being a manager wasn't worth his time. Uh, he was making $30,000 a month in Houston doing leases. That is crazy. That is crazy. Man, Isn't I, it I don't crazy? even know about this stuff. I mean, it's the first time I've heard this stuff, Sean. It's amazing. Wow. Well, let me tell you just let me one up that just so you can understand because it's from the building side. It's it's the, here's what's truly crazy about it. When a building takes on a bank loan, 
right? The building, the bank is like, okay, so we're going to give you X amount of millions of dollars to build this building and start the lease. You need to get to this percentage of occupancy by this timeline, making this much money, or you're going to default on your debt. Right. Not just make your payments, but your building has to get healthy in time. So buildings get scared, right? The, the, the market downturns, oil hits uh, like a new low, Shell and Exxon start firing everybody, which happened, what, 2015 in Houston, right? And so these buildings were giving away two months or three months free to anybody that walked in the front door, not just like somebody like me who's going to take 20. I'll like negotiate special months free. They're giving anybody eight weeks free. And then they're giving the real estate agents 200%, sometimes up to 200% of whatever the rent was. So if you have a $2,000 apartment, the real estate agent would get a $4,000 commission and then the tenant would get two months of that for free. So they're paying, instead of $24,000 for the year, they're paying $20,000 for the year in rent and the building is giving away $4,000 of that in commission. So a $2,000 a month apartment, the building's actually only getting $16,000 for the year when they should have gotten $24,000. That's how much people are slashing in the apartment world wow. when the market goes bad. As an apartment owner, that, that, that yeah, I mean, I'm very familiar with that, with that lenders are, you know, they want to see that rent roll and the rent roll, you know, it's got to, it's got to have that, you know, 95%, 90%, whatever their minimum requirement is in terms of occupancy. But, but, uh, when you look at the rent roll, you look at every single name on there. Now, if you see 60 units that are rented to one company, I'm, I'm wondering, I, you know, I just, I, I don't know how they would receive that. Have you ever heard any feedback on that side? Yes. Um, so one building, uh, this is fun. Uh, one building, I show up and say, hey, I'd like the first floor of this building because it's first floor and it's like disabled accessible. I was looking for a better accessibility. Man, I'm getting a ton of nuggets in this. Wow. Okay. So here's some market research. Airbnb. <laughs> you are. This is great. Airbnb has a four to one search to demand ratio in accessibility friendly homes. So if you can have a wheelchair come in the front door, if you have handrails in the bathroom, accessibility has a 400 percent increase in demand per supply as compared to a usual supply and demand curve for Airbnb. I didn't realize that. Wow. In their best cities, if you have an accessibility friendly home, never say handicapped. Do not use the word handicapped in your Airbnb profile. Use disabled friendly or something like that because handicap's a bad word to Airbnb. Um, But if you're disabled friendly, you'll make tons more money. So I'm searching for disabled friendly units. I'm picking up things on the first floor whenever possible. So I go to this building in Philadelphia and say, hey, I'd like the first floor. And there's four apartments in there. And it's a 28 unit building. Um, Well, that's more than 10% of his inventory. So he goes to his lender and says, hey, I've got this company that wants four of these doors. He's like, well, they can take three because that keeps you under 10% corporate, right? If you have 10% of your leases that are signed by an LLC, it's going to change the way your debt works. Mm. What he typically could do is he built this building and he can take this, he could do this loan where he can cash out at a profit. He can tell the bank that his cost is 6.5 million instead of 5 million to build. They'll give him that loan for 6.5 million and he gets to pocket a million five and then continue to do – he can reinvest that money if he wants or he can just spend it. But he basically gets to have this real sweetheart financing deal after the build's done for $6.5 million. But if he took my deal at 10 percent or better, he could not do that. The bank's going to give him a different type of loan, um, and that type of loan doesn't allow him to inflate his projected cost and cash out for a million five plus. Mm. So – he instead says, well, Sean, I can't give you four units because I can't like cash out at a million dollar, like, like in my pocket. Will you take the whole building? What? I'm like, yeah. What? <laughs> That's, yes. The bank has to scrutinize the, the tenant. So they wanted financials. They wanted to see what my P&L was. But at this point, if you are, if you are a big enough player, like if you have the cash to support the deal, if you prove that you can pay your rents, the tenant, the landlord cares about two things. Is the rent going to get paid? And are my leases going to renew? So tenant experience retention is the second largest part of running your real estate portfolio, right? Is not having to constantly hunt for tenants. So his problem was if he gives me three units, maybe neighbors won't be happy that Airbnb is in the building. Um, So his solution is give me the whole building and there won't be a single tenant that won't renew over the fact that there's Airbnb at the property because they're all Airbnb. (laughs) Wow. Unbelievable. Wow. Wow. Wow, this is crazy. I, I, I didn't realize, I mean, this this kind of stuff's kind of going on behind the scenes. It's, a, it's fascinating. Well, you've, you've 
you've got this great experience. It sounds like a lot of it you've learned just as you've gone along. And uh, I would imagine you've encountered those challenging times, too, where, um, you know, the other things that, that uh, you know, you really learn from those educational experiences. And what, what would you say sort of was the biggest mistake starting out that you did that, you, you know, that people should know about to, to avoid that same mistake? Huh. Um, you know, starting out is a fun relative word. Um, starting out to somebody who's got a, like a six figure business, they'll, they'll talk about like the first week of starting out. If you go to Yahoo or Google, they'll tell you starting out was like before they like did their series B round of financing, right? What is starting out? Like the, the first, well, they, they're a seed compared to who they are now. So starting out, I can't really, I can reach for one. Um, but I think starting out is still was still like last year compared to like where this is going to go. Right. So right. If somebody listens to this podcast a year from now, starting out is a different point. So starting out, I just patched a problem up, right? I just put a few listings on Airbnb. I did not see it as an opportunity. I was so enthralled with my media company and how we're going to change journalism. And I was just learning to actually, I hadn't even learned the program yet. It's in, so in 2014, um, I picked up, I, I put those properties on Airbnb. I just kind of like, I pseudo automated them with a housekeeper. Um, and then I was in Jackson, Mississippi, remote managing my three Airbnbs, learning to program like PHP, JavaScript, so I could write some software that was going to change the way journalism was selling, right? I was so focused on my old business, my 10 year, you know, journalism business that I was not even looking to look, I wasn't looking at the metrics. I wasn't looking at the the, the return on investment on Airbnb, and I wasn't thinking, could I build this? Even though the money was in my face, the, the flashing neon light going, you're doubling your rent every month for almost no money in, um, I was still putting money into the stock market and learning the program and just like really blowing off a big opportunity. So um, I think people, like my mistake was that I was not doing a full assessment of my entire life and what was working for me and was what wasn't. I was so committed to something that I put so much of my time behind that I was kind of like I had blinders on to other opportunities. So my biggest mistake starting out was I, I kind of just ignored Airbnb even though it was making me tons of money. It even saved my newspaper business at one point. Um, I had overextended myself in the newspaper industry and then the, the cash flow coming from Airbnb actually saved us. Um, and I still didn't give it the opportunity it deserved. I didn't let it get center stage until the Super Bowl hit. That was my first mistake. Mm -hmm. Is um, I didn't recognize a good opportunity. That's a great one. And I just let it sit there on the back burner and just make a little bit of money when I could have made a lot of it. I mean, when in the world of Airbnb, when you've got this new move, right? This blue ocean kind of thing where like there's going to be a land grab and everybody's trying to get to it. Um, I mean, you can still argue that Airbnb is kind of in a land grab phase because we're finally seeing institutional investors putting money behind like companies like Sonder and Airbnb just put $160 million into a rental arbitrage company. Like, so a company like mine, there's a company named Lyric that Airbnb invested in to the tune of $160 million. We're finally seeing that as of this year. So the land grab is happening at a big level now. But 2013, 14, it was an unproven market, so anybody could have just jumped in and started making tons of money. And if only, you know, you can take a future opportunity and recognize that opportunity early, that early mover advantage would have, like, I would have made just so much more money. I'd have, instead of having near 100 doors, I'd probably have like 400 doors or 500 doors by now if I would have just moved earlier. So that's, that's probably my biggest mistake is being blind. But I did talk about a different mistake. Um, on my YouTube channel on Airbnb automated and it talked about cutting corners and stuff. And so they, there's one problem that led to another one. And so, uh, first problem that happened is I picked up a building in Dallas. I picked up eight apartments at a property where I was negotiating with one person at the property. They told me we were good to go. Um, but that person had then since left the company before we got our leases. So management had kind of changed hands. And even though we had some communication with the building on permissions, we didn't have the we didn't have our internal champion as a as a sales organization would call it. When you're selling like larger organizational models, you want somebody inside the business who's going to speak on your behalf for you. You don't want to like have no friends. So our friend in this management company left. We took these eight leases. The Lyric, the company that Airbnb invested in, um, just happened to already have leases there. So that created like this whole like whole non-compete claim that Lyric was like, you shouldn't have another building or another company like ours in the building. So then they were getting pressure from, from that company to like not keep our leases. 
So it created a contentious environment. One of the leasing agents uh, was kind of snappy and picked a fight with one of our like one of our tenants. Um, and so that actually turned into like a fist fight in the elevator of a high rise. Seriously? <laughs> yes. Gee. And so that that tenant that well that Airbnb tenant of course then pretty much caused a snowball effect where the leasing agent wanted us out, went to the management, tried to push on us to get us out. They aggressively tried to recuperate their leases from us. So they're like, we want to take possession of this property. Um, we shouldn't have let you lease them anyway because we have a non-compete with Lyric. Um, we want you to move out. How quickly can we get you out of this building? So we lost possession of that building over this fight. So we had to move immediately. Um, so we found another building that was less quality, um, larger floor plans, and about two miles away. We moved all of our furniture into this new building in five days. We executed new leases, new agreement in five days. Problem was the furniture was not fit for these larger apartments. We went from small studios in a high rise to like these little wider floor plans in an older building. So we pretty much tried to force fit the design style of one property into another one. And then next thing you know, we've got these like haphazard looking Airbnb properties, like six of them that just weren't performing well. They're barely making any money because they just didn't look good in photos. So one of my biggest mistakes was just, again, trying to patch a problem. Um, just like I did with picking up the three or taking the three apartments and putting them on Airbnb. That was a patch fix. And then I ignored the opportunity. Well, at scale, these six apartments that I moved, you know, I, we moved out of eight studios and made six larger apartments. Those six just didn't look good. And uh, the reason why they didn't look good is because we just tried to patch the problem. We didn't commit to creating a good product in a new building. We were so busy and so stressed out that we couldn't play a good game. And so well, one of my biggest mistakes lately um, was rushing a project. I rushed that deal. Um, and it just, it just, it really kind of cost us a lot. It cost us a lot on our, our reviews because your Airbnb reviews matter. Um, and it just, it just created a, an eyesore for us and it created a bunch of like logistics and like managerial headaches for us. We weren't making nearly as much money as we should, et cetera. This concludes part one of this podcast series. Stay tuned for the exciting conclusion this coming Monday. Thank you very much for visiting the Old Dogs REI Network. We would greatly appreciate if you would stop by iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. We would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five-star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.